to you then. So, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Christian Hartland. I'm the CEO of the Global Sustainability Benchmark in Sports, and I'm here with some exciting ex professionals, having with me Adam uh, from the Laureus Awards, Chief Executive, and having Kofi with me here, as you can see, from 90 plus and being a former professional football player, which is exciting, and having Andrea from Juventus Turin, the sustainability manager. And last but not least, on the far away side, <laughs> uh, Fiona from SailGP, the global director of uh, purpose, purpose and, and impact. impact. Purpose oh. and impact, it's a long one. Yeah. So um, thank you very much for making the time of Ruud. It could be more, to be honest, because of the topic. Um, and we discussed earlier the topic, as you can imagine, sustainability is, is challenging, as we say. And um, we know it's not, a, it's not an easy one. And um, we've had several panels yesterday. And um, it's my role, I guess, here, even if it's my first and maybe even my last time at the World Football Summit, being a little bit more critical, maybe like Ricky Gervais at the, Global, uh, at the Golden Globes. And um, we could have got the impress, impression that the sports industry is in a very good shape when it comes to sustainability. But what we are doing at the uh, GSBS, we are looking, analyzing and benchmarking the sustainability performance of professional sports organizations, data-driven. And when it comes to this, there is still a lot of room to improve. So um, when we are talking, which is very important, about sustainability, we're looking at the whole spectrum. So we have social-driven organizations here. We have organizations who are applying the full spectrum as well. So meaning we're looking at environmental topics, emissions, uh, resource consumptions, the whole spectrum. If you want to understand it better, feel free to contact one of us uh, afterwards. We're looking also at social topics like gender pay gap. We're looking really deep into the social dr uh, driven uh, aspects of the organizations, but we're also looking at governmental topics. So meaning how is an organization structured? What is it doing on the board? How is it? What's the diversity on the board? So it's a very broad topic. And with this, it is a challenge. We need a lot of data to understand the pure and, and true sustainability performance of an organization. So that means it's a big challenge, and we call this challenges and opportunities. But it's not only challenges. This topic can be a massive opportunity, and that's why those people are here, because they found their way through to position themselves uh, and using such proposition for their organizations. And um, I would like to start with Fiona. Um, I know it's been a massive day for you yesterday. Yeah. You've published your first report on purpose and impact ever, so I know you've been positively excited. And um, first of all, I would like to hear what was your journey to get there, and um, what, why do you think it is so important that you report directly into your CEO and the senior leadership team, but which makes the topic so serious for the organization? Obviously, last thing, you are in a very good position. You, you are working for Sale GP, which is a young organization, so you have the opportunity to build from the scratch. Yeah. And so, big congrats on this massive step and being uh, proud to do so and, and being brave. What was your journey? So, thanks for having us. Having sailing at the World Football Summit is pretty incredible. You know, we felt very glad to be asked, and hopefully we can inspire you to do more sustainability. And yeah, and we're not sailing, so do look us up. We are like Formula One on the water. We're a racing championship, and we've just raced in Cadiz, and we're coming back for four years. So we are all over the world, and do follow us. But we are founded, we're in season three, so we're like a baby in sport, which compared to Juventus, who I just found out how old they are, <laughs> it's easy to be more sustainable and purpose-driven, because from day one, our founder is Larry Ellison, and he wanted to make the sport better. Sailing, audiences were dying, it's traditional, it wasn't very environmentally friendly. So he said, let's do this differently. Let's set up a league, and let's have purpose in the DNA. And we don't call it sustainability, it's purpose. It's what are you doing that's positive? And that's why that's my title. And so we try and make our sport better. So that's inclusivity, driving younger audiences, fan engagement. Like, let's bring to life and entertain people in sailing and racing on the water. And then environmental sustainability, better planet. So it's been really exciting 
being in my role for two years and being able to drive this change and having a team to do that and being committed. But it is easier than traditional sports because we're starting it from scratch. So yesterday, we launched our first ever Purpose and Impact report. And we were talking to Christian. It's scary, right? Putting everything out there to the public and the media is quite scary, even for sports like us who feel we're doing a pretty good job. But you've got to do that. So please read the report, but, but get on the journey. You have to know what your impact is because, to be honest, there's going to be no planet, you know, for no sport. Like, we have to really think about that. Let's not, like, go, oh, let's worry about something. There is going to be no planet if we don't reduce emissions. So sport is a sector that has to take more responsibility. And coming on to that is you need to be committed. So I don't sit in a comms function. I don't sit in a small team. I report to my CEO. And I am their conscious of the business. I am in the senior leadership team. I'm driving better decision making. And you have to do that. You can't be on the outskirts. I don't know if anyone works in sustainability here, but please make sure you're in that decision making room or else you're not going to make a difference. And your board need to see the value of that. And we'll come on to that because it drives commercial return as well. You know, it really is good for business. People ask me, I mean, I wouldn't say challenges here. I would just say opportunities because SailGP has grown exponentially, and that is because of our purpose. Again, we're sailing, we're niche, we're not football, we're not, you know, football, everyone loves football, I get that, but sponsors are coming to us, or host cities, because we stand for more. We're doing things differently, so 90% of commercial prospects come through purpose, 90%. So this is good for your business, so when the boards say, I don't want to be sustainable, it adds value, and it attracts talent. We have amazing people coming from organizations that you think, why are you coming to sailing? But because of purpose, and I do an induction with every single one of them, and they say, I'm here because you're doing something differently. I want to be part of that journey. So it adds huge value. Thank you, and you already jumped into something. <laughs> Lots of questions answered, yeah. later. So, uh, But as you just mentioned, you're a young organization, which makes things easier a little yeah. bit, maybe, to a certain extent. And on the, on the uh, opposite side, we literally have Juventus to deal with you, Andrea. Juventus being founded in 1897, which is a wow. long time, as, as yeah. you have just mentioned. And yeah. uh, obviously, you've not been around at that no, time. Sure. But um, <laughs> so, uh, sustainability is something that Juventus takes really serious, as I know uh, very well. <laughs> and um, you. you have a long-standing history with reporting. So um, on the one side, I have to mention, you are a stock market listed organization, so it means you have to do so by mm -hmm. the financial law, if you want so. And on the other side, I know you and your leadership team totally buying into it and, and are behind this. And to come to the point to actually reporting, um, we both agree on that it's very important to understand your materialities mm -hmm. and your impacts, as Fiona just mentioned. So when you conduct a materiality analysis and an impact analysis, what would you say for you to understand and make the, the, take the first steps, because you have to understand your organization, yeah. what would you say is the biggest challenge from, for, for an older, uh, the old lady, uh, <laughs> as you're called? Yeah, uh, the old lady, yeah. Um, so old what person. would you say is the, is the challenge? So, um, so thank you, Christian. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, these, uh, these panelists, for sure. The, the point for, for my side is very simple because uh, we, the club, uh, the sport organization, are uh, ready to be aware about uh, if their impact for sure, and they'll be ready to talk about this in a very transparent way. This is the, this is the only way to, to start this journey. The simple message that I want to share with, uh, with these uh, uh, people inside, inside this room is that, uh, that our sector doesn't need any more claims. We need to start the journey and take action. This is the message that I want to share. It's a simple message, but we need to, to put in our heads in this way. Yesterday, during our workshop, someone said that the current situation of sustainability in football is very similar to the, the situation of sustainability of the other business 20 or 30 years ago. I believe this is a, a crucial difference between the, the external context is totally different. Now, nowadays, the, the sustainability is not more uh, nice to have uh, because the, all the stakeholders are asking uh, us uh, to do something, to, do, to be, to be uh, more responsible, as Fiona yeah. said, uh, on, uh, on, on what we are doing. 
And uh, if, it, if we agree to, to talk about football as a business sector, here we are talking about the license to operate of a clubs organization and, uh, or uh, what else in, in the sport industry. So my recommendation, I don't believe that uh, we have, uh, or I have the, the one side for all, uh, for, uh, but I believe that I can share just the common foundation of our journey that is, uh, as I said before, uh, transparency for sure, be aware of the impacts, uh, and uh, also the commitment uh, of the company, the leadership is uh, fundamental to, to start the journey. Without that, it's just uh, it's nothing uh, at nowadays, because we are talking about uh, in 2022, not 90s. <laughs> exactly. Um, may, may I link into this um, before we jump to the next speaker? Um, are there any quick wins that you think an organization, when they are starting, we have many organizations who have to start, and uh, obviously there are challenges, even if we want to call them opportunities, um, <laughs> that are maybe more long-term plans. So there are, but there are also quick wins. So there are things that you can actually implement pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, just knowing your gender diversity on your team, on, on the organization, the human resource uh, um, department has this data. So what do you think? What, what kind of other quick wins do you think uh, you could recommend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously, uh, very, 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 very quickly. Uh, I, I think every club, every organization is different. Uh, so I believe I, I, I talked uh, in the same, uh, about this stuff uh, with the other guys yesterday. And I believe that uh, you, you need number. The number is the base of uh, the yeah. choice of a, of a company. Without number, you can do nothing. This is the, the reality. If you want to take seriously inside your company, you need number to motivate your, uh, your request, your choice, your, uh, your plan. And so no matter about the gender, environmental, what else, uh, you need the number to motivate uh, your, uh, your plan, your request. This is my first uh, advice. Perfect. Um, and as you just mentioned, and I, I remember you, uh, and I quote you, uh, numbers don't lie. Yeah. You've, you've uh, taught the ones to me. And I think that's, as I mentioned, the big bottleneck at the moment. So um, we see that organizations more and more understanding the value and the need for sustainability. And we, on the other side, know that it's, it's not that easy. And um, we see... We, as an organization, we, we saw when we published our first report a big difference between the US and yeah. Europe because of historically grown disclosure practice. That's, it's, it's a fact. And therefore, we have two uh, American gentlemen <laughs> here with me. So, Kofi, um, what do you think? Why is it still... Um, challenging for the organizations in North America, as you have played in Europe, you've played in North America, you've spoken to numberless organizations across the NBA, the Major League Soccer, you know what they are thinking. So why do you think we still have this barrier? Is it, is it the, um, this barrier to publish just data out there because you are scared, like Fiona just mentioned, <laughs> that you've been judged and maybe judged unfairly, which can happen, but what is your perspective on it? Yeah, I think Fiona mentioned earlier, there, it's an interesting because I think there is a bit of hesitancy in, in the U.S. to report our data publicly. If you look most recently, uh, the Sports Sustainability Index, which is a reporting framework in the U.S., that's tried to capture data across all of our North American leagues. Oh. at about 25 participants out of a potential 150 teams. So wow. limited participation, right? And then of that, of that, only 17% are actually tracking their GHG metrics of their venues. So there's still a bit of, of real space for our, our, our teams in the U.S. to really move into the direction to start tracking our, our emissions. And that's just, like I said, the venue. So that doesn't take into consideration transport and all of these things. I, I think the hesitancy does come, though, however, and, and it's, it's partly because of maybe a, a lack of understanding of how to utilize the data, how they're going to move in the space. Um, and a lot of teams, particularly right now, they don't have a lot of sustainability um, resources in-house that they're using um, directly to, to address some of these issues. So I think that's one big thing. Another big thing that, that happens in the U.S., as you all know, the U.S. is one of the biggest carbon emitters, right? And yet the education of our populace mm. as it pertains to sustainability <laughs> is, you know, there's a little bit more to be desired. And so I think 
between the education of sustainability at large within the programs and also just understanding how to utilize that data and the value that the data has and feeling comfortable with reporting it because it really should be seen as more of a risk mitigation and an investment long term than as something that we should be afraid of. Great, thank you. And, and as I mentioned, uh, Adam, you are in the ecosystem of the sports industry and you, you talk to many organizations. Obviously, you've been influenced by them, you influence them. So what is your perspective on reporting in general maybe? And what do you think uh, is obviously your strength at the moment when it comes to publishing data? Mm -hmm. And what is your vision? Because you're a purpose-driven organization. You're doing an amazing job when it comes to social. May I, may I uh, be a little bit uh, further? But what do you think is the next step for you then also? Well, thank you for saying we're doing an amazing job. Um, thank you also for suggesting I'm American. I'm based in New York, but I'm not quite cool enough to be American. It's like the My um, uh, so, so, Laurie of Sport for Good um, exists to end violence, discrimination, and disadvantage through the power of sport. It's a mission we were given by Nelson Mandela, our founding patron. And as you say, we work with some amazing brands, teams, leagues, some of the biggest players in sport we work with. Nike, with the NBA, with the NFL, multiple people from around the world of sport to make an impact in communities. We do that really well um, through supporting community organizations doing great work. One of our partners, Slum Soccer, won an award here last night. I'm thrilled Amazing for job. them. Um, and on that, our reporting is, is of a really high standard. It's something we've invested a lot of time and resource in over especially the last six years since the sustainable development goals were released. Yeah. Um, and so we can talk about our work in the community in a really detailed, impactful way uh, around our, our achievements in education, employability, inclusion, gender equity, peace building, etc. cetera. Um, you know, as a nonprofit organization, that's what we have to do to, to, to report on the metrics of what we're, what we're achieving in the community. That's what our partners, our funders want to see. We obviously, uh, like everyone, and uh, as my colleagues have touched on, have some way to go on, on different things. So we, um, as, a, as a nonprofit organization, you're focused on your impact in the community. You're not necessarily uh, historically thinking about your own practices as an organization, your, you know, your, your supply chain, your own carbon footprint, your, um, the practices of your funders and stakeholders and that side of things. So I think the... Um, as you say, sustainability is about, um, is about many things, and on some of those things, we're doing an incredible job, and I think the sector is doing a, an increasingly um, powerful job. Um, and I agree with you, there's still a long way to go, especially on the environmental side. So we're committed to, to getting those measurements. We're signed up to the UN Sport for Climate Action Framework. Um, we've published toolkits for our grantees, which is nearly 300 organizations around the world on how they can move forward. Um, we're shining a light, and Fiona is a judge on this, shining a light on brands with our Laureus Sport for Good Index, which we launched last year, and which Salesforce are our, our main partner on this year, which is highlighting brands doing great work in the world of sport. Um, with ESG as a really strong part of that criteria as a whole. Um, but that's a journey for us, from the, the pure social impact to, to the full picture. Amazing. and and, and as you just mentioned, it's about learning. So, mm -hmm. so it's, I know uh, Fiona uses this quote as well very often, sustainability is a journey. Mm -hmm. So the, the important thing, as Andrea mentioned, we have to start and you're on a way, you, you have your strength and mm -hmm. you have to grow. That's, that's totally normal. And from the other perspective, when we talk about learning and, and develop and education, um, sport is a very special industry mm -hmm. and we have the benefit of having big stars, having the athletes in the ecosystem. And at the same time, um, they usually, especially in the football industry, they get good money, which is fair <laughs> enough. But um, having a professional, a former professional uh, athlete with us, um, we're looking also at how do your organizations uh, actually improve and develop the skills of the athletes, because you can't play your whole life. You ha have to have a career after your career. And we see that 
some organizations still do not enough maybe to prepare those athletes for the next stage. Not everyone can become a moderator, not that I'm a moderator, <laughs> uh, or becoming a, a specialist uh, a, 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 um, on, on television. Not everyone can become a, a, fo uh, a football coach or whatever. So um, you are a shining example. Uh, I think you are heading into managing role and um, having sustainability on the back of your mind. But as I understand it correct, you've built your own uh, education by yourself. So you've not been pushed by the organizations. What do you think is, wh why, what should the organizations do to teach, the, uh, teach or educate the athletes to be a better global citizen, maybe? Not flying every uh, uh, private jet. What can, you, what can uh, sustainability teach the athletes about sustainability? But also, what do you think should be done to be uh, having a career after your career. Wonderful. Yeah, this is a, a really big topic in, in the U.S. right now. And I think for me it's, it's so important, especially because if you look at the athletes have such an influence, and even if you look at social media, so many people are following these athletes, whether they're the big stars like LeBron James or Messi or Cristiano, or if they're athletes that are on the lower level. They still have a big following both in community and abroad. And one thing that I think is really positive is if you can capture these athletes at a young age and start to implement some of these educational tools, whether it be an online training or whatnot, what happens is as these athletes grow and they go into different management roles, via, via uh, sporting directors, coaches, or they transition to the business sector, if they have these ideas in their mind, in the back of their mind, as it pertains to sustainability, then they're going to be much more active in this space when they arrive in these roles. Some athletes that I think of just more, more recently that are doing a lot of really interesting things, because the athlete can also be looked at as even an investor. You look at Hector Bellerin, mm -hmm. he's invested in Forest Park Rangers, and that's a great, great analogy of a club that's trying to do everything right as it pertains to sustainability. Also vegan, also driving a Tesla, right? All these type of things, people are watching, his followers are watching. If you look at maybe a bigger star, LeBron James, right? He's opened up a, a whole education school in Akron, in Akron, Ohio. Another social impact, that's really, really, really impactful. But not just that, all these athletes that come about and that they're gonna be future leaders in this space. And when clubs can help educate them at a young age, especially in that youth, that youth development role, or even after, during their career, then it allows them to transition with a lot more skill sets and a lot more confidence. Because what happens is, as challenging as the career can be, when you leave, sometimes you are trying to figure out who you are again. And it's sometimes often not spoken about, but the reality is you are everything that you are used to doing and, and everything that you know is no longer true anymore. You're no longer on the TV, you're no longer in the paper, and all of a sudden it's like the lights just shut off one day and you're just there. And it's like, who am I? Who is Kofi outside of football, right? And you have to figure it out. And I think when, you are, when you're able to develop some of these skill sets, when the club also ensures that you have a little, some of these these tangible skill sets that you can move forward with and you can feel that you have some strength to push into society with, you're going to join society as a, as a leader in a different way and with the influence that you have globally, I think make an extraordinary difference. Last question on that. Have you, and this is a very private question, but have you felt prepared for your career afterwards when, once you had to stop? It, it hasn't been easy, for sure, if, I, if I'm being honest. And, and I would say... I, for my peers and a lot of players that I know, I've been trying to be proactive yeah. in you know, self-educating, taking online courses, these type of things, because I knew at one point, you know, not all athletes make a tremendous amount of money. In the US, sometimes the average career is maybe three, four years. And even still, even if you make a lot of money, sometimes they lack the education also then to know how to handle the money. And you have a lot of people that are coming around and trying to make money off you as well. And so <laughs> it's, it's not as easy as sometimes people can imagine. And so for me, even as I was trying to continue to educate myself and, and be ready, I found it still very challenging to make the transition, to understand how I fit in into this new role. How do you speak in the boardrooms and talk to executives? It's a very, very different space. Yeah, in, in football, we're very used to saying exactly what we want to say to the player. <laughs> <laughs> and you go direct, and sometimes even to the coach, and then that's it. You come back the next day. It's not so the same, right, in, in, in corporate um, in the corporate space, and, and also then you have to kind of figure out where you fit in. 
And, and sometimes the players, even though on the field we feel maybe the most confident, maybe in the boardroom it's not the same because this isn't the space that we're used to. It's not the field that we've grown up in our whole lives. And so it does take some time. But I do believe that it, as the clubs are learning more and more about sustainability, imparting that knowledge onto the players and providing these technical tools, whether it's via online schooling, to let these players start to develop and have a broader understanding of where they can fit in the world and how they can impact, I think once they leave the game, they'll be much more ready and continue to keep sustainability top of mind, which I think can have a great, great impact on the industry going forward. As in, uh, encouraging stakeholders, athletes, I know, Fiona, you at the CGP, you have implemented something that is really unique from my perspective, and um, it's called Impact Leagues, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah. the Impact League, the and podium for the planet. Maybe you could <laughs> explain a little bit more, and what, what do you think can other organizations, other sports organizations, maybe take away? How can they build their own program to encourage the, the athletes and, and making sure that teams making the most of it? Yeah, um, firstly, like, picking up on the athlete's voice, I think sitting here at football, you have the audience and the athlete, you know, the audience and this tribal nature. And like, don't forget, you can use your voice for good and you probably have the biggest voice. And there's statistics out there, I need to find the survey. And I think it says 70% of the world will listen to sport over scientists or anything else, education. So like, use your voice for good. Use it to tell them something that's going to help change the world. So I just think the power of sport in that using their voice is incredible and athletes play such a big role. But the Impact League is a bit of a crazy kind of brave uh, concept that we came up with at CLGP, and it's incentivizing our teams to have, be sustainable, be good. Look at inclusivity, look at their environmental footprint, and they get money, they get incentivized as a league. You know, athletes are very competitive, we all know that. So we incentivized it. It's all based on behavioral science. So you have a league on the water, racing on the water, and then you have a league for the planet, and they get marked and they get money. And I'm telling you, they want to win both. You know, in the press conference, in our press conference, we talk about how you're doing the Impact League, as well as how you're doing on the water. So it embeds it in the way they operate. And it also helps them talk authentically. Like we were, we were saying, athletes are scared because the media criticize us all. You know, sport and athletes, and the crit they say, you've got a plastic bottle, you've got a private jet. You know, let's focus on the, the positives, but educate and, and make them do something differently, and then they can talk about it. So our athletes get judged on 10 criteria. And it's what we all need to do. You need to eat differently. How are you traveling around? What's your energy consumption? How are you using your voice? And how are you collaborating? Because collaboration is key, right? There's no winner in sustainability. You all need to work together. You know, although it's a league, it's about collaborating for that positive impact. So I think every sport in the world, I mean, my vision, and um, I'm presenting next week at the UN Sport for Climate Action Framework, is that other sports do this. And I will give my time for a sport, hopefully a football team, <laughs> um, to do this because the power of that's incredible. Or the IOC, the Olympics. Imagine that we celebrate the teams that are sustainable on TV. We talk about what they're doing and educate people. Because it's not difficult. It doesn't need to be 10 criteria. It's incentivizing them to do one thing. Talk about your carbon footprint or talk about your travel in the world. So incentivize people in business, in sport, do one thing and then communicate it. So that's the Impact League. And yeah, go and think about what's your Impact League in your business, in your sport. Or if you're a sponsor, make your rights holder or team have an Impact League. Say, we want to do this. We want to be sustainable. And it also brings value. The Impact League, we're winning awards for it. The media are talking to us about the Impact League, not about sailing, because it gives you that USP, that tangible kind of commitment and sustainability. So again, there's commercial value to being good. As you mentioned, it is very important to work together yeah. and finding the ways to support each other. Adam, I know you're doing a great job when it comes to encouraging and working with your partners. And maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what, you, what programs you are driving and what, what uh, is uh, close to your heart, at, let's put it this way. <laughs> Yeah, I think across the, the full spectrum of what we do, there's such a variety of things that it's, it's possible for Laureus as an organization to almost be a, a service provider on the, the things that Fiona's talking about when it comes to social impact, to, to, as I say, to work with those teams. We're working with the NBA to train youth coaches across the, across the US in uh, positive youth development and mental health to make sure that 
as, as, as you guys spoke about, these are not kids who are going to necessarily make it in the NBA, but their experience in sport needs to be, needs to be positive. And I think that's, that duty of care to the young people involved in sport is, is something that, that fits across everything. I think at the same time, we're always encouraging our partners or working with our partners to learn what more we can do. Um, and in, in your spirit of challenging people in, in the room, we have our, our partners from the Gumball Rally, the Gumball Foundation are, are, are here. Um, we're doing incredible things together. They are um, using, using their platform to raise funds, to go back and impact uh, local communities. Um, we, in the world of football, have been hosting some really fun, let's call them pro-am football matches with them. We, we did one with Inter Miami at the end of their rally in the US earlier in the year with professionals, former professionals, um, their participants, and the money from that goes back into our community programs. At the same time, we and they are conscious of the fact that the Gumball Rally involves 100 kind of supercar enthusiasts um, driving for multiple days, okay. and there's a huge environmental impact yeah. uh, of, of all of our uses of cars, you know, and, and, and motorsport, Mercedes-Benz are another partner of ours, is, is an example of that. So it's, it's then working with them, and, 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 and they, as you said at the start, they own it, they acknowledge it, want to understand that impact, and work to be more sustainable. So this year, for the first time, they had electrical vehicles, um, in electrical cars in the, in the rally. They had, um, working with another of their partners, I know they had... Um, cars that were rebuilt from the constituent okay. parts, so to champion reuse and, and that side of things. So I, I think for us, to your question, there's the pure work we're doing with a partner, and then there's the what more can we do and what more can they do to, um, to go beyond the particular initiative and really understand the full picture. I know we discussed this a lot before, but do you think, or how do, how do they usually react if you might ask some uncomfortable questions, saying, like that you just mentioned, maybe, maybe driving around with so many cars is not the best idea anymore. What can we do? So do you, do you drive this as well? I think we always try to... Influence. Influence, and we try to represent the communities we serve. Perfect. So the, yeah. the, the 300 Laureus programs that we're supporting around the world, um, Slum Soccer, who I mentioned, others in different places, they are in underserved communities. They are often very poor communities without access to things, and they're the communities to think of the environmental side, they're the communities that will be most impacted and first impacted by climate change, as we see around the world. So we try to be a spokesperson for them. We try to be a link between them and the sporting space, the corporate space, um, brands and bodies. And so we are always looking to represent their interests and what will have a positive or negative impact on their communities. So that's what we communicate back to our partners. And to... Fiona's point about it being good for business, I think our partners generally are very receptive to that because they want to have a positive impact. They want that to reflect back on their business. They want to grow and have sustainable events or teams or leagues or brands, whatever their, whatever their role is. So um, being able to champion that, that local community voice and try and take that up to make global change is, is something we're very proud of and we see people react well to. Perfect. Yeah, and as you just mentioned, and we, we, we mentioned the emissions, so it's always the, the white elephant in the room. Mm. So from my perspective, again, being a little bit more critical, when we're thinking of the sports industry in general, and when we're thinking of football, you would be surprised how many organizations still don't know their carbon footprint or don't know why it's rising or why it's falling if they collect it. You would be surprised how many organizations might pay their water bills, but they're not aware of their actual resource consumption of water, uh, gas, electricity. And uh, therefore, it is very important that we push the organizations. And I think, especially nowadays, with uh, the Ukraine war and uh, resource shortage, I think it's more important than ever that the organizations start thinking about how, become, how to become more resilient, mm -hmm. how to become... Uh, independent, maybe having solar panels, maybe collecting water because they are watering 
you, uh, Andrea knows this better than me, they're watering several of pitches. That's a lot of money. So you could save money, and I think that's very important that the organizations understand sustainability doesn't only cost money. It brings you money. It makes you resilient to price changes, to, to maybe shortages. And into this, I know you guys over there, um, you both having kind of the same challenge uh, with emissions. It's, uh, we discussed it earlier, Andrea, that scope, uh, scope one and two is, is always the starting point. But when it comes to scope three, which is, as Julia Pali yesterday mentioned, it's 95% of their whole footprint. So that's the, that's the one where you have to act in and have to move. And I know you both having this challenge kind of simultaneously. Um, what is your perspective, whoever wants to go first, uh, when it comes to the carbon footprint in general? What was the challenge to, to calculate? And especially carbon footprint scope three, what do you think is the biggest challenge to actually collect it and measure it and improve it? But should we ask who knows their carbon footprint here? Like, it'd be really interesting. We always talk, but I mean, we talk scope one, two, and three. I, again, does everyone, does anyone here know your carbon footprint of your organization? Put your hand up. I'd love to know. Two so, gentlemen, three. Two, three. See, like, it's still quite new. And you talk exactly. about scopes. People don't even understand the scopes. <laughs> Some people probably the, don't yeah. even know what it means. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, well done, who have. But if you haven't, <laughs> next time you come back, everyone's hands up. Come on. And, and, and again, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm not blaming organizations yeah. not having it in place. Yeah. It's just we need to understand that we're heading forward and we have two extremely yeah, good examples talk, we here. We explain what we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, but so, in fact, we are talking about the, the last mile of the journey and then we have to come <laughs> yeah. back to the basis because yeah. uh, yes. this is the point. Uh, you, your question is right because in the, in the football sector, nobody knows the the terminology, the methodology about uh, carbon emission, carbon footprint. Uh, and uh, this is a point, there's not a right or wrong. Uh, this is uh, the current situation and uh, we have uh, to work on this uh, because uh, as I said, this is, uh, this is the last mile, scope three is the last mile before we need uh, a lot, a lot of, uh, of steps before. And, uh, and uh, as I said before, we need to start, uh, we need uh, to be transparent about uh, the situation of the sector because uh, we have to know that nobody knows the, <laughs> the methodology and the, what it means. We have to, 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 to say the, that we are part of the system that uh, asks to travel uh, around Europe every three days, for example. For sure, we, we know that the, we are not oil and gas sector, so we have uh, a small impact in comparison to the other sectors, but our action is needed, for sure. And uh, all the stakeholders are asking us uh, to, to take action. The fans, the sponsors, the investors, and uh, all, all the list is, is quite long. Yeah. But uh, this is the this is the point, and uh, the challenges are, are a lot for sure uh, when you started. But uh, as uh, as I said, uh, because I repeat myself, but uh, the, the foundation is very important for uh, for me to to lay up all the all the castle to build up the castle. Sorry and. Uh, you need to start uh, be, uh, to, to understand uh, your impact, uh, with your energy consumption, your, your water, your, uh, your, uh, your waste, uh, how the, the team, all the teams are traveling around, uh, in my case, Italy or Europe, uh, and, uh, and you have uh, to, 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 to move step by step, very, very confident, very, very, very slowly, maybe, if you, yeah. if you need it, but you have to understand each step what it means. Uh, and, uh, for example, I take uh, our, our journey. We started just with uh, sim uh, simple reporting. After one year, we, we try to calculate uh, the scope one and scope two. In, in this case, uh, collaboration is very important for, because, for sure, inside the company, you don't have all the skills and the capabilities to do that. And so we start to collaborate with international uh, university or international okay. actors about in, in, this, uh, in this environment. When we, un we understand our scope one and scope two, we start to offset our scope one and scope two. And the next step uh, is uh, the, about the scope three. We, we finalize uh, two years uh, of uh, process about uh, the calculation of our scope three. And uh, as uh, Julia Pelle said yesterday, the scope three is the biggest uh, impact on, uh, yeah. on our sector. The event is case that the, the most impact uh, source is the travel of the fan because, our con because it's, it's our case. But uh, despite to the, to the PSG case of the last two weeks, uh, yeah. for, for us, the, the travel of the, of the teams uh, is not it's comparable tiny, to the travel it? of the yeah. fans. It's, it's, a, it's a very tiny, tiny mm -hmm. point of our carbon footprint. So 
and extremely difficult to calculate. It's extremely difficult because the, 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 the data from the other is not uh, full available, and uh, we, we need to take a lot of assumptions for sure. But for, for in this case, it's very important to collaborate with the, with the right actors in, the, in, the, mm. in, in this environment because uh, you, you need also a, a sort of external review, an external approval of what, you, of what you are doing. Because, uh, and uh, coming back to the PSG case, uh, if you have the right answer to the, to the question, you, you are okay. If you, if you go out with the wrong answer, you are not okay. So this is the, this is the message. You need to start because you need the data to respond to, to this tricky question, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I suppose scope three is your influence. So like scope one and two you control, and they're quite easy, and they're small. Like 99% of my footprint is scope three. <laughs> Pretty petrifying, I'm not going to lie. And I'm going to reduce it. But that's, and that is made up of your supply chain. You can't, you know, like a smaller organization can't influence your supply chain so much, but football, like bigger organizations can. So it's how do you influence people to reduce their footprint and fan travel? But fan travel, to be honest, football, that's your biggest problem. And, and it's like you're sticking your head in the sand <laughs> and slightly ignoring it. You know, it's like the World Cup. You could, you know, 80%, I think 80% is the stat, is their carbon footprint is traveling fans. You know, what are we going to do about that? Because the world we're going to live in, like, you know, we need to reduce emissions. So people won't be able to travel. Like, honestly, I think you're going to have, like, a travel passport, and it'll say five flights a year. Figure it out. And do you pick the World Cup? Or do you pick... So how does sport, instead of, like, putting their head in the sand, we're doing the same a little bit, why do you look at an opportunity? So how are we going to engage the fans? How are we going to commercialize our sport? Not having people in stadiums. But the big one for us in some sports here is, say we race in Cadiz, they expect us to drive huge tourism. So, so we have to get big footfall to get money to race there. But that's terrible for me. We probably had the biggest race. We think maybe over 100,000 people in Cadiz this weekend, which for sailing, I mean, that's incredible. We had 40,000 last year. So that, like, the team is brilliant. But for me, huge carbon footprint impact, my scope three, even bigger. So how do you, instead of kind of being scared or, you know, how do we change it? What do we do? Is it promoting sustainable travel? Is it working with tourism authorities and governments to say, what other value can sport bring than footfall? Because that's got a bad impact. So I think, you know, scope three is scary. It's scary for us all, but it, you have to look at that. And I do think football, if I have one advice, your scope three, figure out your fans. Think about, like, you know, but evolve, because you can commercialize it. You know, Web 3.0, this whole, you know, we have a new partner near. This is a whole new world. We're going to do a, a DAO boat, which is a boat run by fans. This is pretty scary, but it's the new world we're going in, like the metaverse. Like, why don't we embrace that a bit more and stop being traditional? And that's scope three, which, yeah, it is a problem, but I think we all need to lean into it and collaborate to solve it. We only have three minutes left, but I want we could to talk link forever. into this. <laughs> okay, we could talk forever. We made a, made a joke that we probably talk until four. Yeah. But I want to link into this very, very quick question and very quick answer, please. Um, you said, Mark, um, the fan travel is maybe not as difficult to calculate. What was your approach? Uh, well, you need to look at your economic yeah. value. So you have a partner, like we have Deloitte, and they look at our economic um, value. So we have a big um, team that go on the ground and do surveys, and that's how we do it. You know, because we need to do that to get the money from the host city. So, you know, but we invest in that. So that's how we do it. You have a partner to look at it. Maybe. But unfortunately, again, back to the issue, is they'll want to make it look like you have lots of traveling fans because you're driving tourism, which did everyone come to, did they fly to Cadiz for CLGP or were they on holiday and came? You know, so unfortunately, it's, it's slightly, they, they go against each other. But yeah, we, we have that kind of, you know, Deloitte do our work. I'm um, sorry to say that, but Deloitte do our <laughs> other consultancy um, to look at the economic impact. Okay, that totally makes sense. And um, I think, as you just mentioned, sport has unavoidable emissions. Yeah. Let's be honest. We can't change that because... And, and, uh, Juventus has to travel to the next match because otherwise there will be no it's sport. The product, yeah. So we yeah. have to we have these emissions and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I think what I, my aim was for this more uh, evening afternoon um, was to make sure we encourage the organisations to be brave, like you are over there mainly. No offence, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, Fiona just publishing this uh, amazing report. Uh, being really 
brave and, and going out there and, and, and being judged, maybe. Mm. And I think that's the way forward. The sport has to move, and football, I, I know it's been quoted many, many times, but sports, football has to change, uh, uh, the power to change the world. Yeah, and being a role model, showing that you do your bit, will help also that the fans will change their behavior. And I think um, we can, we have some fantastic uh, examples here, and I, I think that hopefully will help us to get the, the, the other organizations to move as quickly as possible. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, I think our time is off. And thank you. Great to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.